Well, uh, Miguel de Cervantes, who uh, was a Spanish novelist and gave us Don Quixote, said, tell me what company you keep and I'll tell you what you are. Tell me what company you keep and I'll tell you what you are. Um, his words probably sound a lot like advice many of us got from mothers and grandmothers when we were young, as we were coming along. You're known by the company you keep. You ever heard that one? You're known by the company you keep. How about birds of a feather, what? Flock together. I mean, there's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? Can you think of any other sayings like that? There's got to be something. We live in the South. There's got to be something about cornbread and sweet tea. <laughs> Lay down with dogs, you get up with fleas. Exactly. A lot of truth in that, isn't there? Any others? The people we choose as our friends and the people we spend our time with really do mold us and they help to mold our reputations as well, don't they? Now, we're going to look at a man who became known by the company he kept. We're looking at this Old Testament personality in Genesis 5 known as Enoch. Now, one thing about Genesis 5, Genesis 5 is one of those genealogy lists from the Old Testament. You know, the begat chapters, so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and on and on and on. And it seems like it never ends. Starting with Adam in chapter 5, we read that different ones begat certain number of children and then they lived a certain number of years and then what? They died. And uh, for instance, let's look at um, verses 6 through 8 in chapter 5. Seth. We know Seth was, um, was the son of Adam. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Very straightforward information. Very um, precise. Pithy, if you will. Men lived. They had children. They lived a few more years or a few hundred more years, and then they died. It's like a, a swinging pendulum. Name after name, men being born, having children, and dying. But something remarkable happens when we get down to verses 18 and following. The cycle is broken in a very profound way. And this name stands out, Enoch. He's very different from the rest. Let's look at these verses, beginning at verse 18. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. So far, this story is very much like everyone before it in this chapter. Then, Enoch, um, beginning in verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Now look at verse 22. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. All the previous people, it says they lived so many years. Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Look at verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now let's consider the context. Enoch 
was born in a day of open, rampant, flagrant sin. This was a sinful time. He lived among sinful people. Genesis 4. I mean, we're, we're talking about the beginning of the Bible. And people were already... I mean, this was just, you know, what, five generations from removed from Adam? And, and people were already living like there was no God. Chapter 4, we read about Cain killing his brother, Abel. And then in, in the next chapter, in chapter 6, we read about the days of Noah. We know what God did when he used Noah, don't we? He destroyed everything else except what he told Noah to save on the ark. Days in which the Bible tells us the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Brother killing brother and as a whole, society was ruled by sin. Does that sound familiar to us today? Absolutely. Every day, more and more. You know, I've been watching, I watched some of the ACC tournament this week, and I don't know about you, but does it seem like every player who gets the ball walks with it before he gives the ball up or shoots it and doesn't get called for it? You know, they, they always taught us you can take two steps. Now they call it a Euro step. They, they're adding... I mean, some of them are taking four steps and they're not calling it, but they'll call it if they'll call a foul if, if they touch somebody. So, you know, things are getting so much more lax. It's, it's, it's hard to watch that and enjoy it when, when you feel like every one of them's cheating, isn't it? I mean, that's the way I feel. And I think that that is the way we have become a society, the way the, the, the athletics, the... Um, the people who, are, who rule over that and the people who call those games and the people who teach the, um, the athletes and coach them, they've become more accepting of these little things. And so the little extra step becomes, if you watch the NBA, four or five steps, right? I mean, it just, and it, it's not the same. And it's, you know, to me, it's, it's not as fun. Um, I remember, you know, when I was coming along in, in football, you couldn't, you couldn't grab someone if you were a lineman. You couldn't grab a, a defender, for instance, by the jersey. That was holding. And, you know, and I was, when William wanted to start playing football, I was trying to teach him how to block without, without actually opening his hands and grabbing someone's jersey. And then I found out that that's okay now, up to a point. You just can't sling them around once you grab their jerseys but you actually do reach up and grab them. That was what they were taught to do. And, you know, it just really, it, it made me say, you know, they've really gotten lax about this. They've really given in to pressure, to be more accepting, to be more politically correct, whatever. But, you know, the same thing is true in our society. We are accepting things that, that generations ago we would not have accepted. Our forefathers wouldn't accept. And, and, and I'm talking about sin. We're accepting it as, as normal. We're accepting it as okay. We're even applauding it. We have to be very careful. Because the day in which Enoch lived sounds a lot like the days in which we're living. When we say, well, it, you know, it is 2019. You know, the Bible is old. It's ancient. It, it's, you know, it was written a long time ago. I mean, we hear that, don't we? We maybe have even been guilty of saying it. But the Bible itself testifies to us that it's alive. And that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so His Word the word hasn't changed. It's alive. It's dynamic. Now the world in which 
Jared gave birth or his wife gave birth to Enoch was a, a difficult time. And for 65 years, Enoch lived in that world without being remarkable. We don't know what Enoch was like. We don't know um, if he made any waves, if he caused any stirs, if he was living as someone who was making an impression on others, if he was living for God or not. But instead, all we know is that it was, it was unremarkable. There's nothing really was said about his life during those first 65 years. But something happened. Something happened that changed Enoch. Something happened that changed his life and his eternal destiny. And it's our second point, the commitment. It was the birth of his firstborn, Methuselah. Methuselah had a claim to fame too. What was that? Yeah. He lived to be an old man, didn't he? I mean, in a world in which people were living to be 600, he, he made it, what, 1,082 or something like that? I mean, he really, he really outlived a lot, of, a lot of his classmates, I'm sure. This, this event, the birth of Methuselah, changed Enoch. It changed his lifestyle, and it changed his perspective. He became a different person. And Genesis says that after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. We haven't read that about any of these other characters from Adam on down to Enoch at this point. But Enoch walked with God for 300 years, verse 22 tells us. 300 years he walked with God. Evidently, Methuselah's birth was a huge turning point for Enoch. He no longer lived the way he had been living, whatever that was. But he, instead of living in his old ways, involved in whatever habits he may have had, his focus now was on his relationship with God. Many of us can testify, if you've had children, it's a life-changing experience, is it not? And usually, we can all look back to something, some event that has taken place that we can say that was a life-changing event. For many of us, it was the birth of a child. Maybe it was the death of a parent or a grandparent or a sibling. But life-changing events happen. And when they do, God often gets our attention we begin to think, you know, I need to do better for my family. I need to provide for this child. I need to stay out of trouble. I need to be a good example. I need to stop some habits so I'll be here for my children, whatever. We tend to, to, to begin to think when something major like this happens. For Enoch, it was the birth of Methuselah. And the fact that Enoch had this dramatic change reminds us of the Apostle Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so, an experience with Christ, salvation specifically through Christ, makes us new people, new creations. And whatever our lives were like before, that's history. God wants to make us new. He wants to make us into His image, into what He has created us to be. At the birth of Methuselah, Enoch 
became a new man. He had a new focus. And his focus was on maintaining a, a genuine, meaningful, and intimate relationship with his creator. And it was then, after Methuselah was born, that, that Enoch began this walk with God. And the Hebrew word that's used here, halak, that word doesn't just mean walking by foot. It means living with, dwelling with, or developing as a, a matter of, of life. So it wasn't just like they were walking around as friends. I mean, he was, he, he was really into God in such a way that, that God became his overwhelming focus in everything. God was, was, was his, his closest friend. I mean, how powerful to think of that relationship becoming such an integral part of his life. And, and the tense of that, of that verb, halak, it, 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 it implies that it was an increasingly intimate relationship. In other words, as time went on, he grew closer and closer to God. That's the way it should be, isn't it? That's the way it should be in our relationships. As time goes on, we spend more time together, we get to know each other better, we become closer. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it was with Enoch and God. His testimony becomes so impressive here, thinking about how he walked with God for 300 years. 300 years in Enoch's day was 300 years. It's a long time. 300 years he lived for God, walked with God. The thing about it, the world in that time became increasingly rebellious to God. People went, grew further and further away from God. So as the world's population moved further from God, Enoch was getting closer and closer to God. What a contrast he was to his surroundings. He who was initially, by all assumptions, was comfortable with the world. He, he didn't make waves. We, he was un, unremarkable in every way. We don't know really anything about him. He must have just been comfortable. He became a prophet who pronounced God's judgment. If you go in the New Testament to the book of Jude, verses 14 and 15, you read these words. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch was sort of a John the Baptist before John the Baptist. A lone voice crying out in the wilderness, challenging people to to get into a right relationship with God in a day in which depravity and apostasy existed. People don't develop that kind of relationship with God accidentally or unintentionally. It doesn't just happen. It takes discipline. It takes resolve. It takes determination. But it's not a relationship without great reward. The intimacy of the relationship Enoch had with God, that we can have with God, becomes its own reward. 
Think about it. The intimacy with God becomes its own reward. You know, I, I, I've thought about Christianity at its best. Um, the church at its best. People loving one another, loving those outside the walls, people doing God's work, if there was no heaven or hell, which we know there is, but if there wasn't, Christianity would still be worth it. Just to have those relationships. Just to have the sweet intimacy we have with God and with each other. The closer the relationship we have with anyone, the sweeter and more valuable that person becomes to us. And so, for Enoch and God, it was 300 years being inseparable. What a powerful testimony. We can't live on this earth for 300 years unless God truly changes some things. About the longevity of life. But we can have that kind of relationship with God. True intimacy. We can't do it by riding on someone else's spiritual coattails, though. We have to choose intentionally to live for Him, to have an increasingly close relationship with him. And then how can it get any better? And we see that in verse 24 with the consummation. Verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. One day, Enoch simply did not come home. He went to be with God. It was like a, a miniature rapture. Enoch did not taste death. He simply went from this life to eternity. With God. He did not have to keep his appointment with death. Now that's a very rare circumstance, is it not? In fact, in the Bible, who can think of any others who experienced this kind of assumption. Elijah. Elijah and Elisha were talking. Let's, let's look at that situation. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. Then he sent him another captain. I'm sorry, that's chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 11. Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. He simply went away. God took him home. A couple of miraculous situations. Can you think of any others? No? There was one more instance, but it was in the New Testament, and it was a lot different. Think about it. Jesus. Jesus died physically. His spirit didn't die. His soul didn't die. He died physically, but then he came back to life. His, his body expired, and then it, then it came back. And then he ascended, as we read in the early chapters of Acts and he talks, he's talking to his disciples and telling them that they're going to get power from the Holy Spirit and then very shortly after he simply went to heaven in John chapter 11 we read this in verses 25 and 26 
Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he, yet he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You remember the situation? Yeah. And, and she was, you know, she wanted everlasting life. And he, he, he made it clear to her that, that there was a way to have everlasting life. Now this, on top of the, the, the promise that it is appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. So how do we reconcile these words when Jesus says, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die? How do we reconcile that with the fact that the Bible also tells us that it is appointed unto man once and once to die? And after that, the judgment. Okay. The physical death. With Jesus coming and taking our place on the cross, he basically, he took our spiritual death on there on the cross. And so while we will die physically, our spirit will never die. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. So, so Jesus took care of that for us. He, he took on our sin and and. His death, though his death was physical, our sins died there as well at Calvary. He took them on himself. And so there is a sense in which we'll never die. The real us, the, the, the soul, what exists in our inner being, the physical is constantly dying. We're in the process of dying as we're living. But the spiritual, those of us who know Christ as Savior, the spiritual lives on. And from the moment we breathe our last breath here, we breathe our first with Him. We open our eyes with Him. The story of, of Enoch was taught to a, a class in Sunday school and a little girl was asked to summarize what took place with Enoch. Here's what she said. She said, God and Enoch used to take long walks together. One day they walked a lot further than usual. So God turned to Enoch and said, Enoch, you look tired. Why don't you just come back to my house and rest for a while? And that's what Enoch did. Can you imagine living a life that's so in step with God that the only way it could get better would be to wake up in heaven? That should be our goal. So the question for us is, how is our walk? How is our walk with God? Have we started it yet? How's it going? Has it gotten sweeter? more precious to us as we've gotten older? Is it growing? I hope it is for you.